bonjour euh, et bienvenue pour euh, cette conférence sur le livre des Lamentations. Euh, J'ai le plaisir de vous présenter le professeur Christian Frevel de l'Université de Bochum. Alors, je ne vais pas vous lire toute sa vie parce que vous pouvez le trouver sur Internet. Euh, il a fait ses études donc, euh, de théologie, des études aussi du Proche-Orient ancien, de la philosophie à Bonn, puis euh, il est devenu docteur et s'est habilité euh, pour l'Ancien Testament. Il a d'abord enseigné à l'Université de Cologne et depuis 2004, il occupe la chaire l'Ancien Testament à l'Université de Bochum. Il a écrit beaucoup de choses et je ne vais pas vous lire non plus toute la liste, mais je vous ai amené quelques... Quelques livres, alors je ne sais pas dans quel ordre. Ça, c'est le livre le plus ancien, mais qui est toujours un livre de référence sur une question où nous ne sommes pas toujours tous d'accord entre nous sur la relation entre Yahvé et Asherah. Donc, c'était la thèse de doctorat. En fait, elle est en deux tomes, mais comme c'est tout un peu lourd, donc je vous ai amené seulement le premier euh, que vous pouvez consulter. Le deuxième est à la bibliothèque, donc vous pouvez tout à fait euh, suivre. Ensuite, euh, il a beaucoup aussi édité des livres sur des questions euh, d'anthropologie et d'autres questions euh, sur les mariages euh, mixtes, mixed marriages, intermarriage and group identity in the second temple period. Il s'est aussi beaucoup euh, intéressé à la question des apports de l'iconographie euh, et des données matérielles pour comprendre euh, l'histoire euh, de l'Israël ancien. Et récemment, donc, il a publié un livre avec euh, des collaborateurs sur « Religious Revolution in Yehud » point d'interrogation sur la question de la culture matérielle, qu'est-ce qu'elle peut nous apprendre en fait sur euh, l'époque perse. Et euh, dernier livre que je vous ai amené, c'est un livre sur l'anthropologie biblique, donc, qui est aussi un des, des intérêts euh, de Christian Frevel. Euh, mais il a encore beaucoup d'autres intérêts, il s'intéresse aussi au Pentateuch, euh, au livre des nombres notamment puisqu'il prépare un commentaire sur le livre des nombres et euh, donc il s'intéresse également à l'histoire de la religion à l'iconographie et à la question aussi des lamentations dont il va nous parler et j'ai vu il y a déjà un petit commentaire qu'il vient de publier sur les Clark Leader et il y a un grand qui va sortir je ne sais pas quand euh, bientôt euh, espérons euh, la conférence donc, est consacrée à la question de la fonction des lamentations dans, dans un contexte de crise. À quoi servent les lamentations Qu'est-ce qu'ils euh, qu qu font Pourquoi aussi on les a attribuées au prophète Jérémie euh, M. Frevel va parler en anglais, mais vous avez le PowerPoint derrière qui vous donne en fait des résumés en français pour ceux qui ont quelques petit problème avec euh, l'anglais. Voilà, donc euh, je suis très heureux que M. Frevel est là. Il est aussi là pour un, un deuxième travail qu'il va faire avec nous sur euh, la question des relations entre Israël et la Syrie dans une perspective postcoloniale. Ça, c'est un petit workshop que nous allons faire ce week-end. Mais euh, aujourd'hui, il est là pour nous parler du livre des « Lamentations ». Et je lui donne la parole tout de suite. Merci. Et je vous ferai passer les livres, donc vous pouvez les feuilleter, mais il faut me le rendre parce qu'autrement j'aurai des problèmes avec la bibliothécaire. Voilà. Merci. Euh, bonjour, madame et messieurs. Je vous remercie de l'invitation à donner à la conférence. Je suis désolé de devoir faire mon conférence en anglais. Mais mon français ne me suffit pas. Foi brisée et la découverte de la théologie. Quelqu'un aperçu sur le raisonnement dans le livret des Lamentations de Jérémie. In this lecture, I want to ask three very easy questions. What is the role of lament in processes of coping with catastrophes? And why is it important to avoid a bias in the concept of God? And my third question, what's the role of tradition 
in coping with loss of confidence. The object of my study will be the five songs of the Book of Lamentations. I'm concerned with the exegesis and theology of Lamentations for almost 20 years. And recently, I have completed a commentary on Lamentations. And uh, regrettably, all my meager publications are published in German language. I'm sorry for that. Lamentations are not easy reading because there's a lot of destruction, disappointment, and depression. They are flooded with God's fury, his murder, and his alleged desperate struggle against Zion. Lamentations are branded by deep traces of violence, lacerated images of God, and the loss of trust. The situation is worse than ever. Hunger, disease, death, capture, looting, devastation, and captivity determine the situation. Negative terms dominate almost completely. Loneliness, childlessness, bitterness, distress, affliction, grief, destruction, etc. Nothing positive is said regarding the situation of Jerusalem. All the light of mercy is superimposed by the shadows of wrath upon Jerusalem. There are much more terms of wrath of God than terms of his love, compassion, and mercy in Lamentations. Lamentations witness a broken faith, a foi brisé. They mirror desperation and long for hope. Yes, that's true, but there are times you need such literature. I remember clearly when I had to prepare my first public lecture in Berlin, 10 days after 9-11. And suddenly, there was an audience that understood the relevance of these texts, and they could esteem the dark symphony as well as the bright undertones. That is a characteristic of poetry. There's much to say about the functions of literature, but one crucial perspective is coping with crisis and to overcome suffering and affliction. Literature helps to construct the old as well as the new reality. And literature may utter the utter non-utterable. Not only for the author, but all the more for the reader in past and present. In a nutshell, this is the reason why I reckon Lamentations as relevant for present times. Not everybody will share my enthusiasm about the poetic quality but no one will deny that there's much to learn from poetry, even from poor poetry. But let me start speaking about poetry with a poem. It's a marvelous piece of poetry written by Rosa Ausländer, whom I like very much. You will immediately understand why I've chosen this poem in our context today. Rosa Ausländer was born in 1901 in a village called Bukovina, which is in today's Ukraine. She died in Western Germany in Düsseldorf, near the place where I live. During the First World War, she was educated in Vienna, migrated to the United States in 1921, and came back to Salnauti to take care of her mother. After migrating to New York a second time for a short term, she lived in Germany under 19, uh, until 1967, until her death a migration existence. Until 1956, she only published in English, later on in her and my mother tongue, German. She was strongly influenced by Paul Celan and his poetry. The oxymoron Black Milk appears in one of her poems. Almost all of her poetry is coping, addressing with distress, the distress of Holocaust and war. It is traversed by metaphors like the blind summer, the sun fails, the music is broken. And always she is struggling with the fact that she's a Jew who survived. Her mother, Katie Rivke Binder, died in 1947, and she dedicated the following poem, My Nightingale, to her. You can read the poem on the slide although it's not a perfect translation from the German done by Francois Mathieu, which is much more than the beloved memory of her mother. 
in the eyes of her mother. There is a former time, the due time, c'est année chevreux, but it has faded into memory, and in this memory, she is singing Zion. And the lyrical eye wants her to sing, like the exiles at the river of Babylon, sing us songs from Zion. The nightingale, her never-ending song, the sleepless dreams are all the more than just remembering mum. It is the memory of her ancestors of her homeland, the old Austria, which is part of the German terror regime, which tried to annihilate all Jews. Thus, it may not be by chance that her dead mother sings songs from, in German, Berge und Buchenwälder, translated as uh, Les Montagnes et les Forêts des Êtres, which resembles Bergen-Belsen and Buchenwald two of the concentration camps. There's no sleep with a terrifying memory, dans le jardin de mon rêve sans sommeil. Although the dreams are so deeply rooted in the child's memory, this does give hope and encourages to remember the brown dew eyes which tell a tale of comfort within a metaphor of fugitive elusiveness. It is not by chance that the nightingale is often used as a voice of hope. The bird is small and plain, but it's singing its beautiful and a promising voice. The voice is that of Zion, the ancestors. It is not only remembrance, it's anchoring the future in the past. It's confidence because the terrible present is not everything. However, the voice of the nightingale, which is coming from the distant past, is colored with grief. There is no innocence in history. We can learn much about lamentations by following the logic of this poem. That the past is never innocent, even if it is desire for hope, reaching into the future, that experience penetrates perception, that everybody needs future, needs future prospects, and that these may be earned by trust in our ancestors, and the tradition that you and they share, that you hold on, and finally that you live in and live on. But now let us address lamentations more closely by starting with a general introduction. Beyond construction, a destruction, composition, correlation, and coherence of lamentations. The Book of Lamentations has arranged five songs into a whole. There's no clear progress or climax, not even a clear-cut end, because the positive closing of Lamentations 422, which expresses deliverance, is nullified by the resumption of grief in the final chapter 5. The last verse of Lamentations 4 would have formed a very positive end of the composition, but Lamentations 5 does not. Compared to Lamentations 4, Lamentations 5 ends, although emphasizing the sovereignty and glory of God, less positive. Lamentations 5, 19 to 22 for a sequence of doxology followed by two rhetorical questions, which framed the well-known Hashivenu Avenu, from the Jewish Amidah prayer. Taking Lamentations 5.22 as the end of the composition, this composition ends with the emphasis of the Argumentum Ad Deum and a direct plea to God, which is rare in Lamentations. The answer to the question is indeed no, he has not utterly rejected us, but the infliction still lasts in the present. This is different to the end with the assurance, the punishment of our your inquiety or daughter science is accomplished. Another striking observation makes the fifth song suspicious to be an addition. Three of four songs start with Echa, understood as phrenotical exclamation. Lamentation three start with Ani. The word Echa starts with the letter Aleph, and this is the feature of the first four songs. They are acrostics using the alphabet as structure of the poetry. Each verse, in case of Lamentation 3, every three verses, 
start with the same letter. Strikingly, the fifth song is not an acrostic, but has 22 verses like the Hebrew alphabet, while Lamentations 1 to 4 are deeply connected by quotations and allusions. Lamentations 5 has less, almost no connections to Lamentations 1 to 4. There are still more differences which lead to the suggestion that Lamentations 5 was an addition. Lamentations 5 is very similar to the Psalms of Asaph, a specific group in the third book of the Psalter. It was attached to the collection Lamentations 1 to 4 to complete the number of five, like the five books of the Psalms and the five books of the Pentateuch. However, there is a line of interpretation which may integrate the fifth song as an integral part of the composition and to explain the attachment not only by the analogy of Psalms and the Pentateuch. It's the sequential reading of the composition, which then mirrors phases of the destruction of the city at the end of the 6th century BCE. Lamentation 1 describes the first assault in 597 in which King Joachim capitulated and was deported to Babylon. The city and the temple were destroyed in the second assault on the city, 587, which was most traumatic in the history of ancient Israel. Murder, looting, incredible hunger are reflected in the fourth song. Lamentation 5, then, reflects post-war phenomenon. Foreigners rule the city, prices explode, and women are raped by the occupying forces. Although there are some clues for a sequential reading of the composition, Lamentation 1 to 5 does not fit all aspects of the songs. At the end of the day, there is not a single clue to reveal the logic of the composition in the Book of Lamentations. Having said that, one has to admit that Lamentation 3 is unquestionably the center of the composition already emphasized by its sophisticated poetry. This is important to notice because the most elaborated theology is focused in the third thong, song. This is deeply interwoven in terms of inner biblical intertextuality. It is a piece of inner biblical interpretation using scripture from all three parts of the canon by insinuation, allusion or literal quotation. Facing this characteristic of the third song, the issue of dating Lamentations has to be addressed briefly. Usually, it is said that Lamentations address the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem in the years from 597 to 587, and the time shortly after these events. Although this is by no means clear because the events are not addressed directly or historically precise, this can be seen as a starting point. The same holds true with the assumption that in terms of, the time, uh, of time, the songs were written in close proximity to the events. This is a good starting point for Lamentations 2, but one should be much more reluctant with the composition of 1 and 4. That said, you may have acknowledged already that the songs do not origin from a one single author. This contradicts the assumption of the tradition, which was held from pre-Christian times onwards, that Jeremiah is the author of Lamentations. However, each song has its own characteristic and it's highly probable that they are not shared by the same authorship. The differences comprise style, vocabulary, composition technique and theology. For instance, chapter 1 focuses on the responsibility of the guilt of Jerusalem, while chapter 2 merely focuses on the destruction of the city and its ramifications. Chapter 4 proclaims the end of the doom, while chapter 2 seems to be just beyond the thick of it. Chapter 3 exogicates on justice, mercy, tradition and hope and it's the most theological of the five chapters. Another example, the descriptions of the inhabitants of the city are addressed in different ways and particular groups of maidens, youth, priests, prophets, officials, and kings. While priests and prophets are murdered in 220 within the Holy Precinct, they are blamed to have committed murder in 413. 
while Lamentations 1, 3 and 4 stress the guilt which has caused either God's wrath or the disaster, the disaster as such, they do not agree on the answer who is guilty and responsible. The first song is the most emotional and the most bodily. The fourth song is the one with the most sophisticated metaphors. Lamentation 3 is the most theological, but it touches upon the city Jerusalem and the events only from a distance. In some, the differences are obvious and in Western European exegesis, there is not a single voice in academia which claims the unity of authorship anymore. The last one who did it was William Rudolph in his commentary in 1993, uh, 1939, sorry, in which the same author, starting with the first assault of Jerusalem, wrote the songs within a generation of time. On the other hand, critical exegesis has turned away from the compositional aspect. The songs were addressed as a single units, which were only compiled due to their topic, the lament over the destruction of Jerusalem. A new theological interest and uh, attentiveness to the importance of composition in Psalms gave rise to new avenues in this question. In this regard, my approach to the book is very much inspired by the Psalter exegesis of Frank Lothar Hosfeld and Erich Zenger. I see the first four songs as a composition, but only the second song stemming from the thick of affliction. Let me make a short lo uh, story long, a long story short, sorry, and draw some diachronic lines. You see the sketch on this, uh, this slide. Oh, sorry. This, you see, see the um, sketch on the slide. The five songs are not from the same author, although they partly relate to each other. The oldest is the second song. Chapter four or chapter one comes next. Whereas the first song seems to relate strongly to the second one, to cover and replace the severe accusation against God by the rep uh, representation of Jerusalem's responsibility. She has deserved her bitter destiny. While chapter 2 was most probably written in the first generation after the capture of Jerusalem, the first chapter strongly relates to Obadiahu, Deutero Isaiah and Jeremiah and maybe already late exilic or even uh, post-exilic, which is around 535. The poetry of chapter 3 has close parallels to Job and post-exilic psalms, and it's written around the second half of the fifth or the first half of the fourth century. It is the latest of the, th the songs. Chapter 4 is difficult to sort in. There's a harsh critique of the role of priests and their responsibility for the downfall, and on the other hand, a restorative admiration uh, of the elite. I reckon it as one of the roots of a theology privileging the poor as a discernible group in Jerusalem. The text has affinities to some priestly texts in the Pentateuch, and by contrast to Isaiah 52. The text refers to the end of Edom in 552 and envisions the end of the exile, which has not yet taken place in the author's view. Thus, the song pretends to be exilic. However, a post-exilic understanding of the re rehabilitation of Judah and the destruction of Edom is more probable in true prophetic, one shortly before the Persian era. Be that as it may, Lamentations 4.22 was an original conclusion to the comp composition of Lamentation. The writing of chapter 5 takes a special role because it does not relate to the other, other four in literary respect. The closest parallels of the poetry are psalms of communal lament. Most probably, the fifth song was attached to the composition to complete the anthology to a quintet of five songs. This may have taken place in the 3rd century BCE, whereas the writing of chapter 5 may be early post-exilic in the context of the mid-5th century. Let me briefly introduce the characteristics of each song. I start, start with the oldest song, that is the second, then moving to the first, the third, 
and briefly touching upon the fourth and fifth. I will not comprise the whole universe of Lamentations, but just to give a glimpse and an impression. Lamentations 2, as already said, it is the oldest song, which is much concerned with God's wrath. In no other song, God is depicted so violent, so aggressive, so relentless in his warfare against, uh, warfare against Zion. He is murderer, he is oppressor, he is violator. Following the female criticisms, even he is rapist. But that's another story. Yahweh is depicted as a fool who has killed Zion's children. In the aftermath, Lamentations 2 echoes a damaged God and a destroyed people. There is no faith in God, no dialogue apart from charges on both sides. Using her last strength, Zion can utter a request in verses 20 to 22, two, which is rather a rebuke. See, O Lord, and consider to whom thou hast done thus. Thus, the second song ends in darkness and loneliness. Lamentations 1 can be read, uh, read as a reaction to this second song, to cushion the break and to... Um, to cushion the breakdown of the relationship of God by some reflections on the sinfulness of Zion. The Lord is righteous, says Zion, for I have provoked his mouth. On the other hand, Lamentations 1 brings up a theme which can be read as a plea for mercy and comfort. The phrase, she has no comforter, is like a motto in the first song. In five times it's repeated. Lamentations 1 introduces Zion as the leading actress of the lament, but not as its speaker. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become. She, has, uh, she was great among the nations. She was a princess. She has became a vassal. All views are concentrated on her in the middle of the stage, sitting in the dust, and wailing, that's pure emotion. But as in the earliest antique drama, a speaker who describes the city's affliction mostly expresses the emotions. Only in a few verses, Zion appeals to either the bystanders or especially with the final verses, the Lord by appointing to her to utter reliance on his mercy. Compared to the other songs, the third is completely different. It starts with, I am the man, as you see here. I am the man who has experienced affliction and who describes the suffering of this person. Without the context of lamentations, one would have no idea that this person is addicted to Jerusalem and its affliction. One would have no idea that this person uh, speaks about the destruction of a city. Only in one verse in the second part, after a we has confessed its sins and complained about the ruthlessness of God, the man speaks about the daughters of his city. Except for this tiny clue, there is no direct connection between the man and Zion. He has experienced grave suffering and deliverance alike. He expects retribution for his enemies at the last verses emphasize. The man has a lot to do with Zion, as we will see in a minute. Compared to Lamentations 2 and 1, the role of Zion is quite different than the fourth song. Zion is less personified and she does not utter a word. There's not a single word explicitly addressed to God. No complaint, no plea, no supplication. In contrast to Lamentations 1 and 3, there's no lyrical I who speaks about Zion. An anonymous speaker who has insights into the fate of the city, but remains strikingly offside and detached utters more than half of the poem. He is not afflicted personally either by the events that have met Jerusalem or by the woes that she had suffered. From verse 17 onwards, there's again a we speaking which has experienced the events. 
Lamentations 4 is a song of lost luxury. No other song is so deeply devoted to the once now pattern and this, um, that it is what was a former good time. He compares children to Zion to gold, to gems, to sapphire, corals, crimson and other luxury stuff. On the dark side of the now, it compares the inhabitants of Zion to soot, dried up, wrinkled wood, filth, etc. The end of the song is remarkable because it predicts with an unallocated uh, prophetic voice the end of the doom of Zion. The punishment of thine inquity has accomplished, O daughter Zion. He will no longer carry you away into captivity. Lamentation 5. The last song addresses more or less mingles the calamity and its ramifications with problems of the aftermath of construction, a uh, destruction. The we speaker seems to live a generation after the catastrophe. Our fathers have sinned and they are no more, and we bear the inquieties. The temple area is deserted. Foxes walk about around uh, the mountain of Zion. The new political masters are oppressing the people and their sovereignty. The remaining inhabitants of the city suffer. They suffer the loss of land ownership, the vast increase of prices, the shortage of grain, uh, the wood, hunger, and other ramifications of the broken infrastructure. There are no indigenous leaders and priests and prophets are not mentioned anymore in Lamentations 5. The people's complaint has a certain objective comparable to other communal laments in the book of Psalms. Adonai shall terminate the distress, which is said to be a ramification of his wrath. So the fifth song ends with an argumentum ad deum, as we have seen above. Now, some aperçu uh, theologique, uh, some theological glimpses in the book of Lamentations. In addition to the brief overlook, let me give some um, theological clues and answers of our first questions. What is the role of lament in uh, the uh, book of Lamentations and in coping with catastrophes? In the book of Lamentations, one faces different models of addre addressing distress. And let uh, us put it as approaches to affliction. Peoples are stunned, overwhelmed effectively. They cry, they sit down in despair. They cannot understand their misery, complain and ask for mercy, care and deliverance from affliction. And if you want, you can relate these aspects to uh, a certain psychological process. I come back to this in a moment. Uh, to a certain psychological processes, which are often described as phases of mourning and grief. Best known is the five phases model described by the American psychiatrist Elisabeth Kübler-Ross. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. But there are other models which use the keywords like shock, confusion or emotion. The phrases are not really a fixed program in which the loss is the start button and the new perspectives come out at the end. It is often a back and forth, a crisscross, a stepping, and a stepping back and forward. There's no fixed pattern of mourning. This is the case in the Book of Lamentation. It is not the five phases which are represented in the five songs. But although the mentioned aspects and approaches are intertwined, each song has a certain profile, which can be highlighted by keywords. Chapter 2, Anger and Despair. Chapter 4, Inconceivability and Overcome by Promise. Chapter 1, Self-Reflection and Plea for Affection and Compassion. Chapter 3, Generic Coping through reflection of a certain model. Chapter 5, emphasis of innocence and asking God to end the doom. The Book of Lamentations testifies and holds on the view that lament is imperative to deal with misery. Not even in the elaborated and sophisticated third song, there's a rebuke for accusing God. Lamentations 1 and 3 add to the opinion that lament is imperative to the understanding 
that it is necessary but not sufficient to overcome the situation. All songs agree that neglecting the harm and misery is no solution, but it is to address it. All songs agree that there is no simple solution to overcome affliction and the ramifications of destructions. Particularly, the first and third song recommend compassion and to complain vicariously with the party that is concerned most. All songs agree that suffering, apart from natural evil, and uh, the, which is not considered in songs, that suffering is something that should not be, but which is in contrast to that obvious and some extent even unavoidable. On the other hand, all songs agree in the fact that God causes affliction with his actions. They differ in the extent of wrath, but not in the fact that there is a relation between human behavior and God's reaction. But while the fury of God in Lamentations 2 is just destructive, excessive and endless, it is righteous but enduring in Lamentations 1, the row but confined in Lamentations 4. In chapter 5, the end of doom is overdue. In chapter 3, his rage is extensive but safeguarding justice and due to a greater righteousness that improves eventually the affliction of the just. Hence, his rage, uh, his rage has some pedagogical function, sorry, too. All songs agree that they focus much more on the city than on the temple. The destruction of the temple is fact, but not the main problem in Lamentation. The destruction hurts the city and it matters. But the song differ in the figuration of Zion. It is obvious in Lamentations 1 and 2, the city, woman which is sitting in, this, uh, in the middle of the stage, but it is absent in Lamentations 3 and striking in Lamentations 4. The songs differ in the intensity in which they formulate the doxology. The shortest form is 118, the Lord is righteous. And the most elaborated argument is in Lamentations 3, which consists of the confession that God comes good, that from God comes good and evil alike, but that he does not afflict willingly. The songs obviously differ in the fact in which extent God has compassion and is merciful. From these glimpses, it evinces again that the unity of Lamentations in terms of authorship is on the one hand very probable, but one has to engage in this question for every single song. So let me shortly go into Lamentations 3 as a theological gem uh, and the role of tradition in thinking. Most important for me is this passage in Lamentations 3, where thinking in a contemplation Remembrance are related to the situation outside. The prayer reflects his situation and its perception of it. The musing nameless man, which am, uh, I am convinced of was the prophet Jeremiah in a very early phase of the reception, is paradigmatic, a role model how to overcome affliction in a situation which cannot be worse. Facing the overabundance of harm, the damage and the broken faith, there is no noticeable escape of depression, depression in this situation. And the man perceives that his lament is a cul-de-sac, which gets him down from the bottom of life. It is quite remarkable for Hebrew lit literature that he now analyzes himself by introspection and that draws certain consequences. These consequences tend to cope with a deep depression. He suffers from rumination of events. Let me comment, comment on this passage shortly. The speaker has described his pain and suffering in verses 1 to 17. All verses emphasize that it is God who gave him the blows. And from verse to verse, it, get, it gets much worse. In verse 17, the peak is reached. The impression is that evil has replaced all wholeness and salvation. That is remembered as shalom, peace. 
he is further away from God than ever. Thus, verse 17 is somehow a summary of the affliction the individual experienced before. Verse 18 is the appraisal of the affliction the speaker has recorded before. All the oppression leads him to consider his confidence. Correctly, the translation Jedi in the uh, Bible de Jerusalem is chosen for Wa Omar, which literally means I said. Indeed, there's no verb for thinking like in Latin cogitare. Indeed, there is no verb for thinking like cogitare in Latin in the Old Hebrew, which seems to strengthen the view that there are no inner processes of evaluation. Hebrew uses chashaf, uh, belief, amar, yada, and so on to express this. But strikingly, the same holds true for the Old Greek, which primarily uses speech-related derivates of logos, logizomai, analogizomai, and so on, other terms like noeo, dokeo, and so on, to uh, express thinking. Thus, the often alleged outwardness of thinking in Hebrew is not substantiated by semantics. Recently, in my anthropological research, I tried to argue against the common view that there is no inner self or no inwardness in the Hebrew understanding of man. But that's another story to tell. The speaker says that he's netzach, gone. And this is open for discussion. It can denote durance, dure, splendor, splendor, or perhaps also guidance, conduit. In the first meaning, it says that the prayer is near death. In the second, that he is no longer a respected person. And in the third, that he is without orientation in his life. Looking at the second stick, the um, espérance, which is also subsumed under the verb amar, it seems appropriate to assume that durée is meant in the sense of durée de la vie. The hope has departed and is separated from Adonai. And it was insinuated in Lamentations 1, Yahweh is the only hope. This is expressed in Psalm 39, 7, 2. What then can I count on, Lord? In you my hope lies. Hope is something which has a strong inward component. It is not an essential thing which one can hand over to a person, like confidence. It has to be molded out of experience and out of thought. But the thought here is remembrance, sachar. The prayer is arguing in verse 19 that gets him all the more down. It is more precise to remember my affliction is wormwood and bitter poison, to translate. Recalling the affliction makes all the more ill and bitter. This explicitly refers to Jerusalem in Lamentations 1. The exemplary man indicates this as behavior, which does not lead Jerusalem into comfort and hope again. And musing about the bad situation is part of the coping process. And it's okay for a while, but it does not get of its misery. The speaker sees this mechanism clearly in verse 20, when he considers rumination as depressing the soul. The figura etymologica is correctly translated in the Bible de Jerusalem. Elle s'en souvient, uh, souvient, elle s'en souvient. The nefesh is more than temperate, it's rather the whole person which is afflicted in the ugly mood. The permanent presence of the affliction brings you down. If you face people who have experienced catastrophes, you can notice exactly this. There's no escape from uttering the same description time and again. It's a doom loop, and always remember the terrific process and experience. The reflection of this mechanism by observance is the inner self, is the masterly performance of thinking. The prayer decides, he decides to make a U-turn out of his vicious circle of depression, and he explicitly 
does this again by thinking. Literally, we will bring back something to this center where his will, his stimulation, his mood is formed. The phrase, to take it to its heart, in verse 21, emphasizes the emotional rather than the cognitive aspect, to call into mind, and thus underestimates the process. It is a deliberate change of mind, which becomes the base for the new hope, al ken ochel, for that I hope. This phrase is repeated in 24 and encloses a passage which forms the argument. How does the prayer concretely want to break new ground for hope? What is his offer to open new confidence in a better future? In a nutshell, it is tradition. He forms a confession on God's grace, which is not depleted yet because of God's faithfulness. It is part of God's self. It is his inner destiny to be graceful. The prayer uses keywords chesed, Rechem and Emuna. This reminds one of Isaiah 54, 8. In overflowing breath for a moment I hid my faith from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. The quote is an allusion to the so-called grace formula. The text which is most quoted in the Hebrew Bible and which is the core of biblical theology from Exodus 34, 7. The Lord is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations, forgiving in quietity and transgression and sin. But the most striking point is at the end of the quote, which the speaker wants to bring into his mind, the direction of speech changes into address. Your faithfulness, ta fidelité, it's wrong in most of the translations because it's, uh, yeah, for the structure not expectable that it is ta fidelité. In recollecting Adonai's steadiness, the prayer overcomes the distance between him and God, which was caused by God's actions. The damaged relationship is cured by retrospection, and the future lies in the past. This is meaningful, and this is meaningful thinking in history. After addressing God, the prayer makes a confession again. Chelki Adonai amra nafshi that Adonai is the portion that is one of the expressions which phrase the benefit of religion. With portion, God is declared as a God of salvation and a good of salvation, which is sustained in the conviction that, good, uh, that God will act in favor of the owner. It is a phrase of election and confidence which reaches out of the future. Thus, Adonai is portion, is the consequence of the assurance of his grace. The following phrase, Amar Nefesh, is absolutely rare. Only in 1 Samuel 24 it refers to the utter will of David. The Nefesh represents the whole person in its desire to live and to live. It is the result of the argument rather than the concrete utterance. The following tough sayings resume the reflective process against the backdrop of wisdom at sapiential tradition. In sum, employing tradition as the remembrance of the benevolent past to open the present to new future is theology. Interestingly, the mentioned tradition in verse 22 to 24 is not a quote, although it could be one. Thus, the prayer remembers something which is formed by remembrance itself. It is the invention of a tradition, which is, is as powerful as an age-old tradition. But this is another story to tell. For me, it's the invention of theology, uh, la découverte de la théologie. The paradigm of the individual and the invention of theology, some concluding remarks. Oh, sorry. 
Instead of a full-blown conclusion, let us come back to my introductory questions. In the foregoing paragraph, I answered the third question, which aimed at the role of tradition in processes of coping. As we have seen, it was a famous one in overcoming speechlessness. It was a way to stick to the experience of others and to experiences of alterity, which, is, which can obviously show that the own perspective is limited and that you need the outside to overcome. Tradition can make things obvious again, which are obscured and narrowed by the experience of lost distress and suffering. Thus, tradition is a way to keep the worldview balanced and uh, or to at least get it balanced. Tradition does not reduce hardship. Everybody has to experience suffering. To put it in a provoking way, there is no substitution, no vicarious suffering, suffering in real life. But there is always a model to draw on. This is one of the functions of religious traditions. Especially of, uh, of the sometimes challenging literature of grief and lament. They struggle with God, they accuse him, they impeach him to be unjust. And they remind him at the same time to be just and all the more merciful. Religious tradition is condensed experience which models coping. In religious tradition it is less important whether this experience or this theology is true in terms of historicity or in terms of a real life. The important perspective is that it can be true, that there were others who were convinced that it is true, and that this truth changed their life and experience. Is this too simple? Yes, it is, but it works. On the other hand, tradition is necessary to avoid a bias in the concept of God. And this is the answer to the second question. Tradition is a safeguard, not to demonize God in times of affliction. There is always another story to tell. It is a consistent reminder of the complexity and the real bias, which is the priority of his grace against his justice. It reminds of, of the other side of the coin, to be honest, I don't want an always loving God who does not face the injustice of the world. Although I believe in his compassion and grace, I need his justice to justify, to do good and to avoid evil. I addressed the process of thinking and reflection as the invention of theology. I grant immediately that this wording is very bold. It may be justified by the original meaning of the word theologia. It is reasoning concerning God and the doctrine of God and most literal, the discourse of God. Lamentation 3 has engaged in all aspects of this definition. The fact that it is worthwhile to engage with the history of God and the doctrine which resulted therein was a discovery of theology. In addition, there is a pivotal aspect which is crucial in my eyes, the role of reflection. That is something that there is something outside and something outside of religion, that it's part of religion. In our example, it was religious itself and part of religious practice, but this does not have necessarily to be true. However, the reasoning of the pluriformity of seeing God's acting and the many faces of God, which are reflected in Lamentations, are fascinating to me. So I hope I could clarify why it is fulfilling and refreshing for me to engage with this literature and I'm grateful to your attention. Let me add a final aspect, the model of individuality. This makes things a bit more academic again at the end, contributing to a debate which we have to face in anthropology and upcoming discussions. We address the relatedness of reflection and coping and the use of tradition in forming the individual identity. Both processes were far from essentializing identity, but rather made clear that identity evinces from processes of ascription and reflection. Both both processes 
were uh, convened in their relatedness to the inner self, in which experience and reflection, thinking and believing, tradition and new perspectives, suffering and distress, as well as hope and coping, were woven into refractions of biography. It was striking that the prophetic personality played an important role in both perspectives. The inwardness of the prophet was regarded as being crucial in the development of a personal identity, which is built not only on processes of ascription, but in the inner self as well. Individual identity matters for the Old Testament. This is a les lesson which may be learned not only from the prophets, but also from Lamentations and other biblical books. Merci.